one second. It, you're right. I, I just missed the recording button. Somebody pointed that out. Thank you very much. Um, so it is recording now. This is session 27. Let's chat an athletic therapy round table uh, with Glenn Bergeron. Um, yeah. So it, I, I wouldn't say that it means you're old. It's just very well established. And anybody hearing that would say there is a ton of experience there. So, so where do we start with you other than asking, uh, um, what have you been doing during COVID? Anything different? You, you, uh, you starting anything new? Have you been uh, watching, uh, I don't know, Tiger King? Did you watch Tiger King? Everybody's watching Tiger King. Yeah, no, I haven't actually. I've been pretty busy because I've had to teach, uh, finish teaching my courses at the university. So we had to go online with the courses and, and uh, finish up the lectures and then do the exams and the practical exams. And I'm sure some of you may have had to go through it as students and stuff. So uh, that's, that was pretty busy. And then, uh, it's actually gave me an opportunity to do a little bit more work with our world, with the World Federation. So uh, we've been uh, get, been pretty busy with the World Federation, uh, trying to uh, get our next World Congress established, and um, it, that will be. We now are able to announce that that's going to be. Actually, I'm pretty happy about it. It's going to be here in Winnipeg in 2022. So the CATA and the MATA will be uh, hosting the conference. So that's going to be kind of fun, and. Um, and also, we've been doing some webinars as well. We've, we've done one webinar, and I've just now organized two more webinars uh, uh, that the World Federation is going to be sponsoring. On the, uh, one on the 23rd of July and one on the, 20, no, the 4th of August. Um, they're geared primarily to academic institutions who are going to be running programs, either practical programs or program assessments and things like that. So that's been pretty good. And we've uh, been very pleased with the reception. Our first uh, webinar had uh, over 550 people attend it. So it's been good. Yeah, amazing. And and just sort of, uh, you, you keep carving these paths for ATs, you know, from, from the start of your career until now, when you look back, uh, it, it must look wholly different now, uh, both with the cataract surgery and, and just from the time that's passed. Um, uh, what would you say some of the biggest changes to the profession have been since you sort of started or since you sort of keeping an eye on that um, as things have changed? You know, one of the biggest changes that's happened over the years is the change in ratio from male to female and uh, that there are now in the CATA, there are more female therapists, uh, members of the CATA than there are males. Uh, where, as when I started, it was actually dominated by, by males. Uh, it was a very small organization when I first started, but I uh, certified in 1975. That was a very, very first certification class. And in that class, and some of you will know Anne Hartley. Anne Hartley was one that was certified with me at the same time. And I remember going to our like our CATA conference, and she was the only female there. Yeah. Um, wow. And uh, so it's had, that's has changed the, the the demographics of the association, I think, for the better. Um, and um, it's been, uh, I think, been a very uh, welcome change to our association. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it must just be so amazing to sort of look back through time, but also to, to know that you've had your foot uh, in all of the stuff to sort of develop, um, you know, the World Federation, the the profession as a whole and these kinds of things. And as, as we have sort of chatted on, on here and, and outside of here, um, as I've chatted with guests on here and then participants on here, um, we, we kind of get the feeling that, that athletic therapy as a whole is changing as well, sort of starting to make some inroads into areas that it may not have been in, in the past. Um, one thing that we've identified, and, and maybe it's a little bit different in Manitoba, I'm not too sure, but um, is, is the, the uh, ability to get in with um, amateur level sports and start having some impact at the grassroots. Is that, uh, is that a focus out with you or, or have you noticed a shift there at all? Uh, maybe in Manitoba or like countrywide, or do you feel that sort of shift coming? Yeah, I think um, we've always had some inroads into amateur sport, obviously. Uh, I know, I mean, I worked amateur sport when I was a student, et cetera. But the difference is that now is that I did them all for free. And now <laughs> the uh, uh, amateur sport is, start, is starting to recognize the value of having a professional on uh, at the events. And so, and they're, they're seeing a monetary value to having that. Uh, that person there uh, in the first instance preventing the injuries and the second if an injury occurs that they're being properly managed so uh, you know more and more of our people are getting paid positions with amateur sport uh, whereas when I did it it was all it was all for free I may have got a t-shirt or a jacket or something you know but so that's been a big change um, 
And uh, of course, we also have more resources because we have more, more people uh, that are graduating from programs. And so we're now able to have a, a bigger outreach to an, a, a whole host of other amateur sports right down to, you know, the community level sports in, um, in hockey, football, soccer, rugby, uh, you know, those primarily are those sports that we're, we're actively involved in. Um, the other is that it's also like the, the profession has, has, has grown beyond the reaches of just traditional sport. So, you know, we're in like with Cirque du Soleil, for example, the major uh, yeah. employer of our, of our, uh, of our profession and, uh, and, and other uh, entertainment industry. Uh, or companies are doing the same thing, uh, and we also have have made major strides in in industry as well. So we talk about the the industrial athlete, for example, and stuff, and and people are recognizing what I refer to as the sport model that we've been able to to evolve to grow, uh, <clears throat> and and people are recognizing that we've had so many successes treating uh, our uh, our athletes with this particular model that that um, that we refer to as a sport model that that same kind of uh, philosophy could be used within within industry and so in the lumber industry and in the um, in the uh, construction trades and uh, they're all now seeing the value of having athletic therapists there working again in the preventative side on ergonomics etc but also dealing with patients in terms of rehab and, and the return to work and so that's another opportunity for employment the other is that uh, i i think that we you know uh, um uh, people in the in the in the industries have recognized the the re really valuable characteristic of, of people who are athletic therapists who choose to come into this profession who go through the profession and who get trained in the profession that they have they have really strong people skills yeah, and uh, so the fact is that they want to have these people with that kind of character and that kind of t um, skill set that they can can identify with people and work with people um, who are injured and get them back to work properly, etc. So uh, there's a whole host of uh, of opportunities. So in the retail industry, for example, um, we have uh, lots of our members, and now they're working in the medical uh, medical um, uh, retail. Uh, industry where they're selling, they're, they're the representative selling, uh, yep. um, uh, you know, hip replacements and things. And they're actually, we have some of our people that are in the surgical suites uh, advising the orthopedic surgeon on how to use that particular appliance. Well, these people have got this academic background, this medical background, and they've got the people skills and they've got the passion. And so that's an area where there's there's growth and there's also growth in the in the insurance industry that people are also recognizing because of the skill sets that that our our members have uh that they are they they make great um uh, consultants in the in the insurance industry and case managers and so we have people working in those areas but largely that, that's basically saying that we have great people and we have a, a sound academic foundation in the a, anatomical, biomechanical, pathological, and the medical realm that makes us pretty valuable people in a wide variety of, of, uh, of industries. Yeah, I think that's an amazing summary. And uh, I think we can all take uh, any number of points away from that one. And, and for me, one of the ones is, um, is definitely sort of the, the breadth of, of the practice or of the profession uh, in terms of um, you know, coming out of school and, and people not quote unquote getting jobs as athletic therapists, but, but there's a ton of work, right. In, as an athletic therapist and, and you can make a ton of things work, um, as you go and sort of get your foothold, um, with all the foundational stuff. And you, you touched on the education and the experience and good people and, um, and all these things. And, um, yeah, I, I just feel like the ability to work, uh, to depth with other human beings, that's, that's a skill that's never going to go away. 
and uh, it's never going to not be used or utilized. So um, you captured it so well, and and uh, and I'm I'm grateful for you to to sort of summarize all that. And I think uh, uh, that's even great to to take forward outside of the profession and deliver. If somebody ever asks, you know, what is an athletic therapist? I think you just <laughs> you just summarized it uh, for a lot of people that that may not be able to do that. So um, uh, appreciate that. And um, and you talked about the the World Federation, and you talked about you know some of the um, the conferences, and that's where you and I sort of sat across the table. Um, where what for those that aren't aware, the World Federation is uh, comprised of. Can you sort of summarize our relationship um, with the World Federation, and and then uh, yeah, just in terms of where where it's going and how things are moving with with that. Right. Well, yeah, the World Federation has been in, in existence since uh, the year two thousand, so we're in our twentieth anniversary right now. So it's. It's, it's still a baby, I guess, by, by the real terms. And when you think that the CATA is uh, over 50 years old. Um, so, um, uh, and it's, it's, it's an association of associations. It's not an individual membership one. So you and I could not join the World Federation as an individual, but your, represent, your association represents it. So the CATA is a, is a member of the World Federation. In fact, they were one of the founding members of the association 20 years ago. And uh, we now have, uh, we have 42 members and we represent, uh, we represent 26 different countries on four different continents. So we've grown quite a bit in the last, particularly in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, when I came in as the president, we had a, a whole structural change in terms of our membership structure and our organizational structure and our bylaws. We went through a the last uh, two years, we've gone through a great big change in terms of how the, the association is, uh, is structured and managed, and the membership has grown considerably with that. Um, and the, the mandate of the World Federation is to, to, is to be the uh, international face of the profession. Um, and, and, and who do who we're going to face? Well, we want to we be the face. We want to be in the space or we want to be representing this profession to other international allied health professions. So as an example, one of our targets is the International Olympic Committee. Right. Um, and if you have ever an, an opportunity to look at some of the, the material from the International Olympic Committee, uh, as it relates to therapy, it's all physiotherapy. Everything is in their, in their manuals, in their, in their, in their um, handbooks, in their policies, it's all about physiotherapy. So our, uh, and one of my personal goals is to change that, is to say, you, you have to also remember that it's uh, athletic therapy is there too, because my experience is, and when we go to the, to the Olympic games, and I've been to a few of them now, uh, it's the athletic therapists that are doing the bulk of the work. If you're thinking about some of the countries uh, where there is athletic therapy, it's, it's a, we, have a, we have a very strong contingent of, uh, of members working in an Olympic Games, and, and, and yet we're not really recognized in, to any great extent as a professional name. And so that's one of the, and then there are others, like there's the FIMS and there's the European Association and there's the Asian Sports Medicine Association. We want to be able to make sure that we're well recognized at those, uh, uh, by those professions. Um, and in order to do that, is to be a world federation, obviously we have to have, we have, to have far more members than we have now. Uh, so we represent 26 countries, but there are 206 countries in the world. Right. Um, the World Chiropractic Association represents 126 countries. So we have a lot of work to do before we can actually say that we're a legitimate e entity. But we are making some real strong inroads in, in uh, some very interesting parts of the world. We've, been do we've done a lot of work over the last two years in Jordan and to the point where they're going to have an association. We've done work in Greece and there's an association in Greece. Uh, we've done, uh, we're working in Trinidad, Tobago, are creating an association, uh, Morocco. Um, uh, we're working with people in Germany and France uh, and Switzerland uh, to, to start to form an association. So it's going to grow over, time, over a period of time. And, yeah. uh, and I, I always say the stronger that the World Federation is, it makes every one of our member organizations that much stronger because you will now be able to, to look and say, if you want to sort of uh, provide credibility and validity for the Canadian Athletic Therapist Association, you will say to people in your own country, you say, 
we're not just a domestic organization here. We are a part of a global movement. And here's the World Federation of which we are a member. In fact, we are a founding member. And that just turns around and says, oh, then this association, your association, the CATA, uh, must have some credibility if they have this international credibility that we, we, we have to pay uh, the CATA the respect that it deserves. Yeah, awesome, awesome synopsis. And uh, if you're looking for one more country, I just spent a couple of years in the Bahamas. So uh, I know the uh, the head athletic trainer is on here as well. I seem to just sign her up for everything, but uh, she, she's amazing. Sasha is uh, on here as well. So maybe some discussion there as well. I've uh, laid, laid some roots and she's going to be up, hopefully up here and, and we'll have some back and forth in the near future yeah. as well. So we can move, move that up. Uh, and not a bad place to visit in the winter as well. So. I know. It's interesting that we, we do have, we have now, we have a uh, European strategic plan. And so we have a group of people in the UK and Ireland and in Greece and Spain who are working on the European strategic plan. We have a Middle East and North, North, Northern Africa strategic plan, which is Jordan will lead that one. Mm -hmm. We have a, a Caribbean strategic plan, which is Trinidad Trin 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 yeah. will lead that one. And then they'll, they'll, they'll do all the outreach in the Bahamas. And we have an Asian strategic plan right now. We don't have a South American one yet, but that's when the next one we have to work on. Uh, 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 yeah. That's when this gets posted to YouTube and uh, somebody picks it up and then we're in. Right. 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 We just keep, right. keep having the conversations and getting it out there and, uh, uh, highlighting all the things that, that we're capable of as a profession and, and uh, amazing work you've done all over the years. And uh, you talked about some of the uh, the Olympic Games you've been to and obviously the PhD and the MSc before, before or alongside those. Um, it, were you ever sort of uh, set on going one way or the other? Or was it an option? You know, academia, quote unquote, academia or, or experiential or like on field um, experience or, or were you always sort of like I, I like both I'm gonna sort of inter interconnect them yeah that's interesting uh, I mean I think very much like a lot of people uh, when I came in when I wanted I wanted to be the therapist for a professional football team yeah yeah I wanted to be that uh, in fact uh, my first job offer that I got was with not an offer I was second in line at to, with the Seattle Seahawks Okay. And so I was applying for that and I was just young. I, I, I don't know. I would never probably would have survived it, but uh, so it's a good thing I didn't get it. Um, <laughs> but then I worked for the Edmonton Eskimos and I worked for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So I, I had my opportunity to work with professional sport. Um, and as fate would have it, I did, I got an opportunity to work at the University of Winnipeg. Um, and I was at, at that time just replacing someone who was working as uh, he was their head therapist at the University of Winnipeg. And he was going off to start his master's degree, and I was I was just finishing mine, so I went there for for a, a semester and and worked at almost no pay, uh, which is part of the story in terms of saying you know you got to take your opportunities where they come because they spill into other things, and then as it happened uh, over the next couple of years, uh, the job came open at the University of Winnipeg, and I was fortunate enough to get that. So I worked as the head therapist at the University of Winnipeg for ten years. And uh, during that time, I felt that it was really important that we start to have an academic program in, in athletic therapy, like a, an entrenched one. The programs were, they were all sort of um, on the side of your desk, you know, in physical education and things. And I thought we needed to have something that's more, was more structured. And so I got invited to go to the University of Manitoba, which is just across the city from me. Mm -hmm. I've been in Winnipeg for 10 years and they, they asked me if I would do that. And I, and, uh, but I was going as the, the director of their, their athletic therapy clinic, not an academic position, but they said, uh, we do want to move into the academic stream and we'd like you to, you know, in two or three years, we'd like to move, move you up to that. So on that, on that sort of premise, that's why I moved to Manitoba. I moved to Manitoba because they had a medical faculty that there's a bigger university. And I thought, well, that might be the place to put a program. But as it turned out, I was there for nine years and got bogged down all kinds of politics because they have a physio program and a medical school and everything else. So there was right. lots of politics and it ended up not happening. And, and then the University of Winnipeg came back and said, we'd like you to come back to University of Winnipeg and we would like to have the program here. So I, I jumped at that opportunity. Uh, and when I went back to University of Winnipeg, I went back to University of Winnipeg as a faculty member, not as an, not as a, um, an administrator. And uh, so that's when I really went into the 
academic stream of things. Although I was always teaching at the University of Manitoba and University of Winnipeg, I always had teach, uh, teaching responsibilities, but this was now, and I was a faculty member. But when I moved to the University of Winnipeg for that second time as a faculty member, I met with the, uh, the administration. I said, I, I will come, <coughs> excuse me, I will come, but part of my academic workload has to be in the clinic. Um, so I, I have uh, one third of my workload is in the clinic. And, I, uh, and it's been like that. I've now been at the University of Manitoba for 26 years. Um, again, and I've, and I've been an, an administrator of, of those 26 years that I was an administrator for, for uh, 11 of right. them as a chair or as, a, as an act, as a associate dean or as an acting dean. But all of that time, even though I was an administrator, I still worked in the clinic two days a week. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I just feel like that's so valuable, right? To be able to be on both sides. And, and I know there's a few students on here from, from various programs or we're all students to, to some right or have been. And uh, the, the pearls and the nuggets that, that end up holding water from the clinic are, are sometimes so much more valuable than, uh, maybe not more valuable, but they sort of um, heighten the value of what's going on in the classroom. And when you can sort of connect the dots on both sides, somebody who's on both sides, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, that's, that's, that's massive. Yeah, I've always said that being a clinician is maybe a better teacher and being a teacher is maybe a better clinician. And it's just a great mix. And so, and I also am a person who likes variety in my, in my job. Uh, so I had an op the University of Winnipeg and, and the University of Manitoba, for that matter, gave me the opportunity to be a clinician, to be an educator, to be an administrator, and I never got bored in any one of those because I never did any one of them for too long a time. So I've, I've, I've had this variety in my life and I've had uh, ongoing opportunities to, to uh, have new challenges that keep you keep you motivated and keep you moving and keep you growing. And that's, that's the essence of having your jobs is that you don't want to get stagnated. Yeah. I, I, all of all, all such rich uh, dialogue and, and you talked about opportunity and sort of um, making lemonade out of lemons when you're not making much money or you, I don't know if you, you're getting a t-shirt or a jacket, that's nice. Do you still have any of those t-shirts and jackets that you got? I yeah, I bet, like any good therapist, you got them racked up in your closet probably. From yeah. chron don't, tell my wife. <laughs> yeah, don't tell my wife. She thinks they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> Chronologically somewhere behind the, uh, I don't know, fur coats and whatever else is in there. But uh, yeah. And, and you talk about timing as well. Right. And, and, and it's not just a matter of good timing or lucky timing you sort of set yourself up with the road that you create um, academically the people that you meet the timing of you know when things are happening and how they're happening and it seems to be almost like cosmic alignment when you look back at it but your hard work pays off and and all of us have been down the road of not getting paid very much or um, you know working for a t-shirt here and there it, it doesn't last forever and you've talked already about all the amazing opportunities that have been uh, uh, that you've helped in carving as well and I keep coming back around to the conference and you know I, I started out in the U.S. as a as an athletic trainer out of Canadian school went to the U.S. and then came back and and with each year that I've been back I've attempted you know I've gone to the CATA conference been lucky enough to, to present as a breakout speaker a couple of times and and I just feel like that growth and that that shift is really changing that the the, uh, the dynamic nature of the profession is really shining through with the conferences and the different people that are talking and the, um, and you're really seeing different skill sets you know from athletic therapists and uh, and you talk about um, uh, you even talked about the CFL and I just have, have had opportunities to work with some CFL guys of late and uh, some athletes just during this time. And, and one of the other things that keeps coming up is uh, um, putting the athlete at the center of the focus and, and allowing the practice to be driven by who's in front of you instead of, you know, uh, what tests to do or what's to come next. Um, how do you sort of, uh, how do you exemplify that for students on, on your end out there, you know, making sure that they remain focused on the person that's in front of them or, or centered around, you know, athlete care as much as it is uh, uh, learning a checklist of, of what to do and when to do it. How do you balance that out for students when you're teaching them? Yeah. Checklists never work, you know, <laughs> they, they, there's never any one person who's the same, you know, so you, you just, you have to have that foundation. You've got to have all those tools in your toolbox, but they, you, they come out in all kinds of different orders. And uh, you just have to be ready to, to know which one to take at the right time. And, and sometimes you don't 
sometimes you don't take the right one at the right time and you learn and you don't make that mistake again. You just move on. Right. But yeah, you, it's absolutely right. You need to be a uh, athlete centered, client centered, patient centered, whatever it is. You need to be able to make that connection with a person uh, first and foremost. And I, I always say the most important thing that you can do uh, in terms of getting somebody better is to get them to trust you. And, um, if you if you get them to trust you and and they are willing to then comply with some of the things you you are asking them to do or they also feel comfortable in saying uh, I don't feel this feel that so that you know it's a partnership when you talk about the rehab process I'm not doing anything for this person I'm just guiding them along and it's up to them to do the to to, to do the things to, to, that are going to uh, lead them to the recovery. Um, and so they just have to be able to learn and we have to go through the, we have to journey, go on this journey together. And, um, and in order to do that, you have to have that connection. And that's why I say, you know, the majority of the people that I've seen come through our programs, I am so amazed with their people skills. Uh, they, they, they can relate to each other as professionals. They, they can relate to the person. Uh, they, they show compassion, they show dedication, they show, true interest and empathy and um and and that's when your your clients or your athletes buy in um if you're thinking about athletes for example like one of the toughest things you're we're in such a hard position we're kind of we're in no man's land as an athletic therapist we're not part of the coaching staff and we're not part of the athletic program we're somewhere in the middle yeah and we have to we have to bridge that gap and we have to have we have to be able to have interaction and uh, with a coaching staff, but we also need to have the athletes trust in there. And so I always used to go and have a talk when I joined a team, I would always have a talk with the team and I would say, um, I'm the athletic therapist here. I want to win as badly as every one of you coaches and athletes. I want to win. I want to win this championship as badly as you guys do. I'm going to do everything I can to win. Except, yeah except there's a line. Uh -huh. I have a line. And my line is going to be the one where I'm going to have to make the hard decisions. And sometimes the decision is going to mean that we're not going to win. Uh, but I'm going to have to make that decision. And I'm going to, and I tell my athletes, I say, I don't, I look, don't think about you as a, a 20 year old or a 23 year old athlete. I think of you as a 55 to 65 year old grandparent. And I'm going to say, what I'm more interested in right now is your quality of life throughout the lifespan. And you're, you're stuck in this time zone and nothing is more important for you than this time zone. But I'm stopping and thinking, but there's more to it. I know there's more to it. And I need to make sure that you have the, the um, uh, you have a quality of life that you deserve after, after when, when this time period is over. Um, and I, it's interesting in, um, I can't remember what year it was. It was in 1984 or 86 or something. One of our conferences at, in Manitoba, I was the, the chair of the conference and we had a panel discussion of all retired athletes who came back and spoke to our therapists about what quality of life was like now. Yeah. And, uh, it was a most emotional presentation that people everywhere cried because they said, Oh my God, here's what their quality of life is now. And they say, they all said, if I had known then what I know now, I would have done some things differently. And I wish people had told me that. And, uh, and I really wanted to impress that on people because, you know, we as we can get stuck caught in that whole emotion of sport and we can make some decisions that are not in the best interest of that person. And uh, because it may be in the best interest of the winning but really we're here for the best interest of the person. And um, so I tell, I tell athletes that I, I tell people and I'll tell my coaching staff and tell everybody else the role. I see my role. It might be different for you, but my role as an athletic therapist is to protect the athlete from the coach. Coaches go, what are you talking about? I said, my role is protect the athlete from the coach. I said, you as a coach, your job is to win. Your job is to think about technical and tactical and to win. That's your job. You do your job. Okay. And the athlete is their job is they're going to do everything the coach asks them to do to win. 
And somewhere along the line, there's got to be a protection there. So I protect the coach, the athlete from the coach, and I protect the athlete from the athlete. Yeah. And so I'm the one who has to draw that line. When I think it's unsafe, it's my job. That's, that's my role. That's what you hired me for. So uh, because you don't want to make that decision and the athlete feels they're not even capable of making that decision. So they hire me to make that decision. This is, this is perspective that, uh, you know, I, I've never heard delivered in this manner in my career. Uh, and, but you're hitting like these, these levels with me where I'm sort of uh, evolving as a therapist and practitioner, having stepped away into some different roles and looking back in perspective and, and sort of a more holistic approach to uh, my take is a more holistic approach to performance and blending wellness and performance together instead of treating them like two separate entities. And that's sort of where I'm going and where my mind's at. But, but I love this in terms of like, I'm looking out for you from so many different angles. And I think that's, um, I mean, I'm getting messages just saying this is this is way this is amazing hearing this and 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 you know having you as such a, such a huge following and, and trend setting manner about you know your career and the way you've gone about things and how professional you are and dedicated and all these things. Um, so to hear you say that in that perspective of of looking at the person as as a as a grandparent uh, in their twenties. Uh, I, that's, that's massive. I mean, from experientially I've worked in, in all levels of, of, of professional sport a athletics and university up and down. And, uh, and it's, it's hard sometimes, you know, for any one of us in our current role to step outside of the time zone, the space, the, the whatever that we're in. Right. So even as a therapist, I I've now, now where I'm at look wholly differently than uh, I used to at the whole performance realm. But you talk about, um, best interest from a yeah wow from uh, protecting an athlete serving an athlete and then for the longevity of their of their career um, on here uh, a week or two ago I was talking about just meeting up with a, a young man who who had finished his career as a professional uh, baseball player and I went and met him in the park because I used to I was an athletic trainer and he was just in his first or second year out of college and uh, anyway we went to the park and we're just playing catch and he told a story about like how uh, and he just kept doing this with his hands. You know, I, I spent so much time working on my swing, working on my swing. And, and it left so much to be desired in him out of the things that he could have been or all he spent all this almost like he was, you talk about it, um, uh, emotional. I, I mean, I was, I, I had my son with me and I was like, I, I was getting goosebumps from talking to him, just hearing him speak like this was the end almost, you know, and, and that he had wasted time and wasted effort. And, uh, um, but life after that identity of an athlete, yeah, sometimes we forget about that. And, and I think this is, this is knowledge that as anybody who's here as a young practitioner, or, or this is eye opening to hear, even for somebody who's been in it for, um, 10 or 15 years, like, like me. So Glenn, again, really appreciate you, you being here. And, uh, I'm just taking pages and pages of notes. And I know everybody else is messaging me here saying like, this is, this is, uh, well worth the free admission here. And, um, uh, uh, I thought you guys were donating. <laughs> <laughs> awesome to hear. Well, we are, I mean, we're all donating time and things like that. And then the, uh, the next CATA conference, I think again, coming back around to, excuse me, the, the basis of, of these chats, um, just to connect people and, and get perspective, right? Like, so, um, for me to be able to talk with you across the country and have uh, a few other people listening now, and then more people when it gets archived, like, this is networking at its finest in terms of uh, uh, taking an opportunity out of something that was never there before and, and really sort of utilizing these downtimes away from, I don't know, what we're all used to and, and making this happen. So um, I, I, I just, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you again. Your work has, has penetrated, you know, all of the fields that everybody works in and, uh, and everybody that's made time to be here tonight, like, uh, and that will listen in on, on YouTube is grateful for this too. So um, to thank you publicly for all that you've done and uh, to be in the hall of fame, you know, and, uh, and still be completely active and like, uh, you know, within the profession, that's pretty awesome. I think they're going to have to come up with a new thing. It's going to be like a, uh, I don't know, something bigger than a hall of fame. It's going to be like, uh, I don't know, maybe like a clinic of fame and it'll just be you. That'll that be great. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, so five, five Olympic games. I think you worked, uh, any, anything that stands out from working those games other than like, we need more ATs, uh, in Olympic games. Um, uh, from, from a memory standpoint, something that really jumped out at, at you from, from any of those that still sort of hangs around. Yeah. You know, I, I, whenever anybody talks about that, there's, and I've written about it a couple of times in other areas, but 
there was one particular incident which was just an amazing, amazing opportunity for me where I, this was in Sydney. And um, in, in Sydney, I was the chief therapist for the, uh, for the Canadian team. And so I didn't assign myself a, a team event because I, I did, wasn't going to have the time to spend time with teams. But I worked with individual teams. So uh, I, I worked with Simon Whitfield with the, with the marathon. So I was there at the finish line when he won the gold medal. And then I followed him around and, you know, we had to go and do all the drug testing and everything else and on that one. And so it was an amazing experience to, to have that. And I was working with uh, um, the, the physician there um, um, and he worked a lot with Simon and, and he, he predicted well before the race was over that Simon was going to win it. And Simon was in like seventh or eighth place. And he said, the way Simon's running his race right now, he's going to win it. And uh, sure enough, he did. And so it was an wow. amazing experience to be there to watch that. Um, but the one that was probably even more memorable than that was uh, I, I worked with um, Dominic Bossart. Dominic Bossart was a uh, 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 Taekwondo athlete. She was our only Taekwondo athlete at the games. Yeah. And, um, and so I worked with her and she was from Manitoba and I had her as a, as an athlete patient before. So I knew her from home. So I ended up working with her and, and she had to, she was competing in the second week. So that means like the first week is train, 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 but she's the only person and they brought in a sparring partner for her and I'd go to her, her practices with her and things like that. But there was this big, long, you know, lead up to her competition and she was actually a medal hopeful. And, um, but in her first match, something happened and she lost her first match, unexpected, sort of an upset and everything else. And so that meant that she now had to go through what, what they call it a reposage, the sort of the roundabout way to get back into the, into the metal round. And uh, she was absolutely discouraged, totally discouraged mm -hmm. by this thing. And their coaching staff were pretty discouraged. And, and uh, so, she and I went out on the front lawns in front of the venue in, in, and uh, they, uh, so we're sitting on the grass and we're kind of talking and she was totally despondent. She says, I'm, I'm done. I'm quitting Taekwondo. I'm going to find another sport that I can get back into the Olympics with. And so I started talking, well, let's, let's, what, what other sport would you do? So we kind of talked about, you know, finding another sport that she might be interested in that she wanted to get into the next Olympic because she's that talented. Right. And all she was this and that. And as we were doing that, there's a big lineup forming in front of the, the uh, uh, facility the, uh, to get back in for the second round. And um, she, she was, said, I'm not fighting. I'm not going into the second round. Because the second round, she had, to, she had to fight someone from Costa Rica, someone that she had fought five or six other times, but had lost most of them and had gotten beat up badly by this girl. She was a huge, very strong girl. Yeah. And she says, I'm not going. I'm not going in. I'm not going to go and fight. Why would I do that? Why would I go and get myself beat up for nothing? And so we talked and talked and talked. And then uh, this line was getting longer and longer and longer in front of people waiting to get in. And I stopped. I said, you know, all these people are standing around there. And here we are, like we're within a throw, stone's throw from them. And they have no idea who you are. But they're paid money to come and see you fight. But they, have, they don't even know who you are. You're sitting right beside them. And they don't know who you are. And I said, your job is to make them know who you are. Wow. I said, you're at the Olympic Games. You know, there are millions of people who would love to be in your shoes right now who would want to do this. And you're at the Olympic Games. You have to go in there and you got to make sure that they know who you are. And, uh, and then we looked up. I looked up and we were sitting underneath a maple tree. And it had these huh. huge maple leaves. Yeah. yeah. And I go, look up. What do you see? There's the maple leaf. Wow. And we said, you have to go. You, you can't. And so she says, okay, I'll go. But her coach wasn't with her. So I had to go in as her coach. And I had to go in and we had to go in. We ran in and we just we had to do this quick, quick warm up. And uh, she's doing these kicks and stuff. And I'm holding on this big bag that I, I haven't done any of that before for her. And all of a sudden she winds up. She takes a kick at this bag. And she sends me flying. I'm rolling in the ground and everybody's laughing at me. She just kicked me right off my feet. So we said, okay, I guess you're ready to go. <laughs> so she went in and it was, she, she beat the girl, an, an upset. 
she beat her. And uh, so she got into the bronze medal round and she wow. got the bronze medal. And then, we, and then we have all this thing happening. Now she's a medalist. So now it's like the media wants to talk to her. She's got to go through all the drug testing that has to happen. And cars are coming to pick us up and we're running around all over the place. CBC is waiting for us to do an interview, not us, but her, for an interview. So we go like about two hours of just nonstop chaos after she wins. And we finally get back to the Olympic Village and it's like one o'clock in the morning. And there's not a soul around. So it's nobody even there to congratulate her. She's won this medal. <laughs> and we walk in and so we get in front of the medical clinic. Go, okay, well, what now? And, you know, we're just, we're still so I hyped. And I go, man, I, we, had a, we had a bottle of wine in the clinic. So I went in the clinic and got this bottle of wine and a couple of chairs. We sat down outside and we were underneath the Southern Cross. Clear, oh, wow. clear sky under the yeah. Southern Cross. And we had yeah. this wine and we go, Life can't get any better. It was just the most amazing experience. Ah. Uh, yeah, so that was so much fun. Yeah. That is just, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm getting messages and, and just people saying like, this is, this is a, a legendary story, legendary. It's almost like it's happening as you're telling it and, and really feeling that emotion from you. And, and this is it for athletic therapy as well, right? Like, like these are the things that you don't know are ever going to happen. Um, but when they do, and then you, you, in the moment, you don't even, I don't know, maybe you did, but in the moment you, you didn't realize how much impact you have with these athletes and how much impact they have in your life too. And it comes yeah. back around full circle to sort of this, the, the human first approach to, to everything that we do and the, and the skill set of, um, you know, being able to, to engage with, uh, another human being on whatever level that might be. And, um, Wow, what a what a powerful story, and I feel like um, everybody needs to hear that one. And uh, uh, yeah, and and for her too, I, I, I'm sure just uh, could probably tell the story the exact same way. And uh, uh, man, just 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 I don't even know where to go with that one. You left me. Hey, I get those goosebumps again just hearing you talk about it. And um, we, we've still communicated back and forth on it in the past, like every so often, every couple of years, we touch base again, and it's, it was yeah. just such an amazing experience. Another one, I uh, just kind of gave you a little bit of sort of technology stuff. So in uh, that was same thing in 2000, um, cell phones were sort of kind of brand new. You know, like we didn't have cell, nobody had cell phones, but we got cell phones as uh, as part of the mission staff, so we could talk to each other. But there was no such thing as everybody having a cell phone. And uh, I remember being in the opening ceremonies and uh, when they uh, were lighting the cauldron, I phoned home and I talked hmm. to my family. I'm on the field and they're sitting there watching TV, watching the cauldron being lit. And I'm talking to them on the phone, opposite ends of the earth. And we're talking together and uh, I'm having a brain fart right now, but the, the fellow who won the gold medal in wrestling, he was the last gold medal at the end of the, at the end of the games and we were already the games were over kind of thing and we were already back at the village having our our final uh team party thing and he came back of course there's a great big celebration celebration because he won this gold medal and i was talking to him for a bit and and uh i said you know you're gonna be a real inspiration for my son and we started talking about my son because he was a wrestler and i was coaching wrestling at the time <laughs> and I said, but my son's kind of moving away to hockey because uh, he can't do two sports. He's finding really tough. He goes, what do you mean he's moving to hockey? I said, well, it's really hard to do two sports. He says, well, I need to talk to him. I said, well, you can talk to him. I pulled out my cell phone. I phoned my son. Yeah. You know, I'm in Australia, and I yeah. phoned my son. And he gets on the phone, and he says, Brian, this is – and I, I'm sorry. His name Daniel, is Daniel Igali. Daniel, Daniel Igali. Yeah. So Daniel yeah. comes out, and he says, this is Daniel. And my son goes, yeah, right. You know, no, this is Daniel. I get on the phone, Brian, it's Daniel. And so he had a, he had a talk with Daniel Legale, uh right after he had his gold medal. And my son, he's talking to my son, you, you need to continue with wrestling. I mean, it was just an amazing, amazing experience. My, my son still remembers that to this day. Wow. So those kinds of exper Olympic experiences are just great. You know? Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. This on the other hand, I had to uh, give you another experience in yeah. Barcelona, and this is now 1992. And we had, I had a sailboarder from Manitoba, 
and um, he was a gold medal hopeful for, for Canada. And we got there, you know, prior and he got there. This is like two or three days before the opening ceremonies. And uh, he's in the Olympic Village and he's walking down a street and he gets hit by a police car going the wrong way on a one way street in the Olympic Village. And he breaks his leg. Wow. And now he gets rushed into our clinic and we say, well, your Olympic Games are over, right? And so that was really, really hard to, to take. And I had to now make all the arrangements for him to go back, come back to, uh, to Winnipeg to see the orthopedic surgeon to get the surgery done here and things like that. Uh, that, was a, that was a tough one to try and do for this poor guy. His whole career was, went down the drain at that one. So, yeah, so just, he, he had the, lots of ups and downs and highs and lows. Yeah, but but all of them sort of, uh, you know, pivotal moments in careers, right? And you never know what conversation or when it's going to pop up and the, uh, you know, different roles that you have to play and different hats that you have to wear as an athletic therapist, no matter where you go, clinic, uh, clinic in Winnipeg or Olympic Games or, you know, and, and it just sort of brings up that, uh, I don't know, that quote is, is just sort of about collecting experiences and not collecting things, right? And that's living life and that's learning and that's doing, uh, and that's doing athletic therapy in, in my uh, short-lived career is, is very much the experiences looking back and not the, uh, uh, not the things. Although those t-shirts are great and they do, they do pack a nice uh, component, <laughs> a nice portion of my closet as well. But uh, man, so many good experiences that uh, we're getting requests that we could have you on like uh, maybe monthly and we can just do story time with Glenn. <laughs> is that a thing you'd be, you'd be willing to take on? I feel like, uh, I, I feel like this is um, exactly what therapists could use, um, you know, just to see w exactly what's out there. And, and again, another premise of this, of this platform was very much to show the diversity in what we do and having somebody with your experience and, and your, your willingness to, to, um, to come on here and share is, is amazing as always. Um, you can, get, you can get Alex to come on cause he's heard, he's heard most of these stories already. <laughs> yeah. did, did, hey, hey, Alex, do these ones change or they, they get, they get a little bit bigger fish tail. The fish gets a little bigger every time or does he nail it pretty much every time like this he nails it pretty much the same each time yeah 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 they're exact they're hard-lived experiences that are just yeah. ingrained and and wow have shaped you and i'm sure shaped all your students and uh, it's amazing to see the impact that uh, that you have had and continue to have and um man just just really grateful for you to be here and share this and, and to lay the foundation for us Glenn, in honesty, like uh, I sat down at that table as a mentor in 2019 at the CATA conference. And I was like, I know a couple things. Like, I'm happy to share my experience. And then you sat down and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm just going to sit here and just listen this whole time and it'll be great. And, uh, and I pretty much did. And I know, uh, I think Nathan was on here anyway. He was at the table as well. Um, and, uh, and, and just nice to sort of like connect dots as we move forward in the profession and, and through these times to navigate them together with people and, and listen to stories and experiences that, uh, that everyone can share in and, and probably acknowledge on their own level that, uh, you know, it hits home on a certain level with every one of us as therapists and, and the roles that we play. Um, I'm sure I can. I'm sure I can learn a lot, even from your stories. All of you all have stories already. I'm sure I could. I I personally could learn from you too. So, uh, anytime I get that opportunity, I'd love to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I I think the next conference is going to be. This is my thing. It's like the next conference after hosting these these little let's chat things and and sort of you know trying to grow uh, the profession in a different kind of way in my own sort of idea of how I can help with that and uh, and everybody else who's on here on a regular basis. Um, yeah, I, I, there's, there's a few messages coming in, so I'm getting distracted because I get distracted by shiny things. But uh, um, it, everybody just saying it'd be great to sort of just sit around and uh, maybe. Maybe we can do like a giant campfire, uh, <laughs> a CATA conference around a campfire with, uh, and just tell stories because that'd be pretty awesome too. You, you talked about a panel. Um, maybe we get a panel at the next conference that's just uh, 10 of the best and they just tell a story each and, and every, everybody can just sit and cry and laugh and, and do all the things that, that, <laughs> that we need to do. This is, uh, this is awesome. Um, we, did have a, we did have a panel of uh, few years ago i think probably three years ago okay. we had a panel of it was a history panel it says seven o'clock in the morning and i go nobody's going to get up at seven o'clock in the morning to come and listen to a bunch of old farts well the place was full yeah, and it could have gone up. on for 
yeah, it could have gone on for the whole day. Like it was just an amazing thing. I could, we should do this more often. Yeah. I'll tell you that um, when I was in your shoes and, and uh, when I would go to the CATA conference, um, I, I'll, I'll confess, uh, we had sort of the old guard. There was the, it was like the founding members. My mentor is Gord Mackey and uh -huh. Chuck Badcock and uh, Ed Nowakowski. Some of these guys, these are all the founding members of the association. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of the second wave of the, of the profession. But the first wave, those old guys, I mean, uh, what we would, they would always sit at the back of the room of the lectures, you know, and then they would sneak out and you'd watch them. And when they snuck out, we would go with them and we'd go, we'd follow them and we'd go wherever they're into their rooms. And that, that's where all the rum was flowing and everything else. <laughs> that's where all the stories were being told. Like every night you go, you had to go and go and sit with those guys and they'd tell all these stories. And it was absolutely amazing to be able to go and listen to see some of the stuff that they had to say, you know, and, and their experiences and how they, you know, what they, their passion was. It was just, you know, we were always totally enthralled, but we always used to sneak out of the lectures. And as soon as they went away, we knew, <laughs> okay, they're going for rum and we're going for the stories. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I think, I think there's a lot of that to be said, you know, and, and again, like, like this is the, this is the opportunity to sort of connect people that haven't been connected. So the next time you're at a conference, uh, don't, don't be shy to, um, when a whole bunch of people run up to you and say like, they know you after listening to you speak, I feel like everybody feels like we know you, um, you know, like we've been old friends, but, uh, it's great. That's the, I mean, that's the best, right. Where we could sit around and just sort of share stories. Um, but also I love these conferences now, you know, and the CATA and, and some of these where you can go, uh, share some story time, ha have some rum if that's your drink of choice, but you better have a drink. Uh, and then, and then, uh, and then stay up until seven in the morning when those, uh, when those meetings are are happening i think yeah. half the half the population stayed up but um and just you know share the profession and it just grows organically that way and, and a lot of these discussions on here have been you know interconnected with uh, various practitioners from various fields and i think that's an important uh, thing to acknowledge as well when we talk to to somebody as ingrained as you are um you know it, there's nothing territorial about being a, an athletic therapist either and that's one thing that i really value as a as as a therapist as a professional um to sort of be open-minded enough to to reach out and refer and be referred to with other professions it doesn't matter to me where what your background is um if you're a good practitioner and you're you're, you're willing to help then i think that's important too and, and it's nice the theme has been very uh, organic and everybody feels very much the same way that's been on here so uh, it's been really cool um, I, I'm just going to open this up quickly Glenn if, if you're okay for another five or ten minutes sure. um, if anybody has any questions or, or comments just feel free to, to um, type them in the chat box or um, uh, or, or unmute yourself and, and just have uh, have a chat here quickly before we get to the end of this one this is uh, yeah time's flying I just feel like we just started talking and uh, and this is it. Um, my rum is not flowing, but uh, next time, next time, I think. Uh, so, so 2022, uh, y y the host is going to be out there, right? Um, and it'll be in summertime. So that'll be good. Uh, not, yeah, winter, is, not winter. It's, and winter, going, winter it's going to actually going to be a combined CATA World Federation Conference. Yeah, very cool. So, yeah. So Perfect. we're going to be able to bring some international speakers in to speak at the CATA conference will be just, it'll be just great. We, they haven't got the theme picked out yet. Well, I think, no, there is a theme on the theme is going to be recovery. Mm -hmm. but they haven't got all the speakers, uh, the topics broken out yet, but it should be a great conference. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so if anybody has anything, please feel free to type that in 2022, start booking your tickets. Cause I'm sure that one will sell out uh, pretty quickly. And uh, if you're sitting at the back of the room, I know I'm, I know who I'm keeping my eye on when, <laughs> when you leave. So just so you're aware, I'll be in your back pocket. Uh, is anybody 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 everybody yeah um julie dixon uh tell us about what you would consider the worst injury you've seen oh you know one of the the one that comes to mind i'll give you sort of the one that pops out in my mind well it's been a, now they're starting to pop up all over the place but the one that really <laughs> came to mind was when i was the edmonton eskimos and uh, our kicker uh went to kick uh, a punt and he got hit by an opponent and um i knew we were in trouble when we were running out on the field he was lying on his stomach with his head into the ground but his foot was pointing upwards 
Yeah. So he had a total fracture dislocation. And of course the crowd just, you know, they go, oh, you know, the big, oh, kind of thing. And they basically stick to this. So the first thing we did was go in and cover up his foot so the people didn't have to look at it. But I remember running on the field and go, oh, no, this is not good. You know, so uh, that one comes to mind like right away. And it was really early on in my career. Uh, uh, that was, that would have been in uh, 1975, I guess, so a long time ago. Um, I remember uh, an athlete, a basketball player here in uh, at Manitoba when we had the 1999 Pan Am Games. He was a basketball, a basketball player for the Canadian team, totally dislocated his knee. Like, yeah. And so we had to reduce his knee on the field, like on the court, because he had uh, blood circulation. So uh, Dr. Andrew Pipe, who's a doctor uh, with the Canadian team, uh, and I, and well, he did the reduction, I did the holding, and they also had to stop hold him down kind of thing. So yeah, that was a, not a good one to have. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, there, I've, I've never had anybody die on me, thankfully. And, um, but, um, I've had lots of people with, I've had spinals, uh, yeah, a few, a few spinals. Yeah. And, and we talk about sort of the roles and, and the conversations and the experiences and, uh, and, and this again highlights, you know, sort of the depth of, of our practice and our profession, um, being able to handle anything and everything as it comes and being ready, you know, and so readiness, uh, readiness as therapists that are working in the field or, you know, e- even outside of the clinic or outside of the field, you, you have a skill set that can be applied um, g- globally in, in a situation of need. And uh, um, yeah, it's amazing sort of the breadth and, and the scope and, and you're able to handle all of these. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story. I, I don't know if Alex has heard this one. I, he probably. I think he has. But uh, he'd hear uh, it again gladly. I'm yeah. sure. I was still a student at this time, and I was working a for nothing for a major junior hockey team in the city. And um, most of the guys were well. They were all the same age as I was, and there, some. One of them was actually one of my best friends, and uh, he he got hit at center ice. He was looking backwards to receive a pass. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the, the the opponent, the, one of the defenseman who happened to be a city cop, uh, cross-checked him right through the chin, right through the mandible, and lifted him off the ground. And he was in the air, unconscious. And I saw the—I mean, I saw the hit happen right away, and I knew that this was—I was over the boards before he hit the ground. Um, and I ran over to the to the to him right away, and he was in convulsions. And uh, he had me chewing on, on chewing gum, which is another lesson, right? So yeah, I, had right. <laughs> to find, I had to kind of get this gum out. And he was in, he was in convulsions, and and I'm trying to deal with him and trying to stabilize him. And we've called for the ambulance already. And, and while I'm doing all this stuff, the player is arguing with the referee that he shouldn't have got a major penalty. And so he's sort of right there. They didn't get him off. And he's yelling and screaming. And I can hear this in the background, sort of, I think. And I'm, But I'm dealing with the, this player. The ambulance comes. We stabilize him. We board him. We get him off. Uh, and as I'm coming back from uh, – we, we, we got him out onto, into the ambulance. And I'm, I'm coming back onto the ice. And as I'm coming back onto the ice, they're taking him, the player who hit him, off the ice. And – he and, and like he's a, a city cop, uh, and in his skates, he's six foot eight, right? And I'm, I'm five foot ten, and I weigh nothing. And, anyways, for some reason or other, I have no idea why, but I jumped him and I hit him, I punched him because I was so mad. So I jumped him and I punched him. And as I punched him, I said, What am I doing? Because he's going to turn around and kill me. And luckily enough, my players came and they got me off before he got a swing in and they pulled me away. And they took me away and they took me back into the dressing room. And I got into the dressing room and I was shaking uncontrollably. I was uncontrollable, shaking, 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 shaking. And uh, when I reflected back on that, uh, on the, the whole situation, I looked at sort of how I dealt with the thing and I dealt with the thing very matter of factly. Here's one of my best friends who could be dying uh, and I have to deal with him. And I just dealt with him like a robot. Yep. Uh, I just went through the protocol I supposed to do. So when you guys do your protocols, you got your ABCs and you got your primary, you know, your, your, your protocol, 
you got that's got to be like a robot and i just i just operated like a robot no emotion whatsoever in what i did but then when i when it was all done and he was safe and secure and on his you know on his way then the emotion kicked in and i was a basket case and what i learned from that is if i if that emotion had kicked in while i was taking care of this guy I would not have been able to provide him with the care that he needed. Mm-hmm. And it was so important to keep this emotionless because I saw what the emotion did to me after it was over. And uh, that's, that's always, always stuck with me in terms of, you know, make sure that you're prepared emotionally, make sure you're prepared to do things in a, in a robot sort of way. At the time of the event, you can't afford to let the emotions take over. Yeah. And uh, the only way you can do that is if you prepare every time. So um, my students come in when they go to these events, they go, well, you know, I'm really scared to go. And I go, yeah, and you always should be. You should always be scared prior to an event because you understand the magnitude of the problems that could happen in this event. Mm-hmm. You understand that magnitude. And what you need to do is make sure you're prepared for it. So prepare for the worst and hope for the best but be, be, be ready for the worst. And uh, that, that to me, that, that experience as a student is what brought that out to me. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's obviously incredible advice for, for all of us. And, uh, and, and we've touched on it a little bit, you know, um, we had an athletic trainer on here from, from my days with the Blue Jays who's now with the Atlanta Braves. And that was his major advice as well to me as a, as an intern, um, and I never thought I would have to use any of this stuff, you know, life-saving stuff, but I always knew it and I was always ready. And it was always in the back of my mind, you know, where, where are the emergency exits? What's the EAP? And this is where the checklist that we talked about, not as important as experience really plays a, a key role in sort of understanding <clears throat> that all those things are in place. Um, and to the point that you talk about, uh, sort of dealing with that emotional, um, release or that emotion after dealing with a situation like that, that that comes brings on a whole nother element of, of therapy and athletic therapy. Um, ha- having someone to talk to, having people to go to, having people that you can, um, you know, uh, uh, relieve some of that with is, is massive. I, I just had my first ever uh, experience with uh, uh, with somebody passing away in, in my hands and it wasn't in a field. It wasn't uh, it wasn't covering anything. It was responding to an emergency um, down, down in the Bahamas that we heard, you know, at a construction site and, and you, you bring that up and like shaking and all these kinds of things. And, and I was just that same exact way was very much like, this is what's happening. There's nobody here who knows how to help. Uh, I know how to help. So all the screaming and things like you, you guys need to leave and, and let me sort of handle what I can handle here. And, um, and, and, and the second that I walked off the construction site, I, I just about melted, you know, and, uh, and, and still sort of like down the road, you know, six, eight months, 10 months later, you still feel ramifications of that. And, and you talk about all the positive experiences. There are some of these that, that really hit and, and stick in terms of trauma and what we're taking on from other people. So um, it's a nice little segue to, to mental health and making sure that we're taking care of one another. And, and I know Francis and you may be privy to, to the 911 for, for athletic therapists that's available and these kinds of things. But I think also setting up strategies for, for athletes and um, uh, and it sort of brings full circle back to the panel that you discussed with athletes after their careers are done and coming back to, you know, <clears throat> what their quality of life is, um, setting these things up while you go as well from a mental health standpoint, as well as physical performances is, is massive for, for all of us. So, um, I, I'll just read one, one more question, uh, here, if you have time, are you okay still You're yep. under the gun? Okay. Um, uh, well, Julie wants some words of wisdoms that you share with uh, words of wisdoms that you share with graduates as they head out into their professional careers. Um, and, and then there's another one with uh, with injured athletes and, and staying calm. So um, I'll, I'll let you field that one quickly. And then we'll do we two more questions and then we'll end it. I promise. I hate people ask me words of wisdom because I go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think you've given them. You've given them this, uh, whole, this whole chat already. I think, uh, you know, first of all, be yourself. Uh, uh, and um, uh, keep things into perspective as well. You have to have perspective in terms of where, where, where you fit into the whole global picture of this. You know, you have a life away from athletic therapy. Don't, let, don't necessarily let athletic therapy consume you. Um, there's a life away from that as well, and you want to have to foster that as well with your families and things. So keep things in balance and, and keep things in perspective. And, and also, you know, like you're, you're trying, you want to, 
like I say, you want to keep things in perspective and you want to be able to uh, uh, keep your athletes and your coaches in perspective as well, as much as they can get caught in the emotion of this is the most important thing in my life. At the end of the day, it's not. I remember uh, a, uh, a two, two quotes, uh, one from, a, and they were both from sportscasters, but one was um, a friend of mine, Scott Taylor. Uh, he, he was in the operating room with his wife and she gave birth to their first child. Mm -hmm. And when he came out, back out, he said, I have just witnessed the mo the greatest athletic event in my life. <laughs> right. And um, so from that perspective, he says, you know, that's, I mean, that's pretty important. And the other one is a, a fellow here in Winnipeg too, uh, uh, Bob Irving, who is a very, he's a, he's a, he's a legend around here in terms of his football and stuff. And he said, uh, I'll paraphrase it, I think, cause I won't know the exact words. But he says, it amazes me how people uh, uh, feel so, uh, um, passionate about something that means so little. When you right. think, when you when you stop to think about the the perspective of, of of you know where sport fits into the whole global thing of life, like, can you tell me who won the Grey Cup in 1973? No, right? right. I can't. Anyways, um, yeah. Neither uh, you guys weren't even born there, so that's a bad year. But <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, those are that's what happens, right? They they're so important in the in the, in the moment. Yeah. If you take it into the grand scheme of things, it's 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 part of life. It's not the only. It's not all of life. So keep those things in perspective. Make sure your your family is the most important thing uh, for you because they're going to be there forever and ever, uh, where your teammates come and go. Amazing, amazing advice. And somehow you tied the irrelevant conversation that you weren't even privy to before you got on here to the relevant conversation because we were just talking about how. Um, before you got on here, how the, how the Blue Jays are going to bring the team from uh, Florida to Toronto for their spring training or their second spring training. And like that, that's all now that's essential travel. Right. So um, anyway, just, just interesting that, yeah. that that all comes full circle as well. Uh, yeah. So a ton of words of wisdom, um, strategies or questions you would use to keep injured athletes calm or distracted in emergency situations if they're conscious. Uh, well, it comes down to this whole trusting relationship that you've had, right? So, uh, first of all, you, you're the one who has to be calm. You have to be calm, uh, mm -hmm. because they're immediately looking into you and they're, you're the barometer as to how bad this injury is. Cause they don't, they can't look down at the ankle. They're lying down or they don't know that the bone is displaced and stuff, but they're looking at you. Uh, and, uh, if, if you show signs of, panic or of extreme concern then they panic so that's important you have to when you go to that to the to the scene where you come on to the athlete you need to be calm so as you're walking or running or jogging out you need to be you need to be calming yourself and then you say okay listen i've become a robot and i now i'm just taking this thing methodically but you also have to say to talk make sure that you're reassuring them and go to them first, obviously, we all know that. Go to the head first. Go and find out what they're, you know, whether they're breathing, et cetera. But so if they're conscious and they're breathing, you know, okay, let's just relax, you know, calm down, tell me what's going on, move, and just make sure that they, they feel like they're in good hands. And that happens well before the injury happened, right? Yep. So uh, that's, that's all about the relationship that you've set up with this team and with that particular athlete that they know that they can put, they can take risks out on the field because they know if the risk goes the wrong way, they've got someone there to back them up, right? And so uh, then you just have to go in and just give them the the, the reassurance: we're in control, so we're okay, you know, and get yeah. them to calm down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, super powerful advice. I think sometimes we get so caught in the moment that. Um, that we forget that everything that we're laying down on a on a day to day basis, on a conversation to conversation basis, that all makes a difference, right? In the long run. Yeah. So, um, funny story I had. I'll just give sort of another little funny story that comes to mind. But when I was at the University of Manitoba at the time that I was there, this was before Laval had a football team. Mm -hmm. uh, University of Manitoba was the only school in Canada that French speaking athletes could come and play football. Because we had an affiliation with a French-speaking uh, university, Saint Collège Boniface, and uh, so we had all kinds of French athletes 
uh, being recruited to come and play for us. And our coaches always made a point of bringing those athletes to our clinic to meet me. And, uh, and I would start to speaking to them in French. And right away they go, oh, it's Papa Rosette. And so, yeah, so they right away they go, oh, okay, somebody's going to understand what I have to say. And so they had this connection right away. But then when we were in game situations, if somebody got hurt, I, I'm the lazy one. I don't run out. I send my students, right? So the students would run out. So I'd say, well, this is, this is your learning experience. If you've got a problem, call me. And, then it, and so if one of them would fall down and get hurt, they'd, they'd have trouble with them. And then all of a sudden they'd wave me on. i go, oh, this is more serious than we thought it was going to be. I'd run out there. And they'd say, we don't understand a word he's saying. He's speaking in French. And he's fluent in English, but he's speaking in French. We can't understand a word he's saying. So I would go down to him and I'd start talking to him in French. And as soon as I started talking in French, he would relax because now somebody can understand what the hell he's trying to say. But so what it was is when they're in this stressful situation, right. they would revert to their first language. And so they couldn't, now they don't communicate. So I had to come in and initiate this communication. As soon as I did that, oh, okay, I'm good now. Then we then we do our job, right? So it was an interesting uh, when you think about relationship and making sure you have this connection, um, and you have to learn to talk the language. I've had experiences. Of, I've had a really neat experience of working with professional rodeo, for example. Right. So I've worked professional rodeo. Well, in professional rodeo, if you if you go to the rodeo and you don't have cowboy boots, Wrangler jeans, a Wrangler shirt, a cowboy hat, and a buckle, they're not going to talk to you. Yep. They just won't because they go, well, you don't understand rodeo. And so you guys got to go in there and talk their language and talking with track and field versus football versus hockey, totally different language. Right. So yeah. it's both relationships. Well, we, we need to talk rodeo. I think uh, next conference, we'll just, just hunker down and just talk rodeo. I'm sure there's some stories <laughs> of the rodeo and, and getting into that one too. So uh, last, last question, I promise. What's the best way to go about advocating uh, athletic training or athletic therapy profession in a country dominated by physical therapy or physical therapists? Yeah. Well, um, we have been, I have been uh, in this, I won't say fight, but in this, uh, uh, back and forth, if you want, with physiotherapy from since from the time I I was in in uh, in in athletic therapy programs at the university and stuff. So since 1973, I have been involved in this back and forth with between physio. But one of the things that we said when we were moving towards trying to get legislation and get ourselves in in on the insurance plans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I sat down with all of our people and I say never ever degrade another profession yep don't don't say a bad word about another profession but always always build yourself up you know but not at the expense of another profession but at you know build it you you need to show what who you are what your capacities are etc never ever degrade another profession and we did that and it worked out very well for us as a profession uh, over time, particularly in Manitoba, because we had to do a lot of this groundwork here uh, to set the stage for athletic therapy for insurance coverages, uh, et cetera. Um, and it worked well for us and other professions did, did the opposite and it worked against them. And so, yeah, in fact, it's interesting. I just saw a thing that came out from our MATA uh, today, actually, from our MATA office, and they were saying essentially that it's saying that we don't want to see anybody degrading any other or organization. And I don't know where it's come from. If it's just something that's a routine sort of message they're going to start putting out right now, mm -hmm. or if we had some issues. But uh, I, I've always said never ever degrade another organization. Uh, yeah. 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 Perfect. And uh, and just go back and, and watch this video uh, a couple times before you're presenting anything. There's a ton of good stuff in here in terms of how to how to present what it is that we can really do as a profession and and the breadth and the scope and, and the integrative nature of, of athletic therapy, athletic training. So um, really amazing stuff tonight, Glenn. Uh, this has been Let's Chat and Athletic Therapy Roundtable Session 27. Um, appreciate you taking the time. I wish you the best of uh, with the recovery fully from uh, from the recent surgery. And uh, 
uh, and I hope we can stay in touch here in the next uh, next few weeks, next few months, until we can get together again and uh, chase you out of the room with some rum and uh, whatever else you're drinking on, on that night. Uh, it's been great, man. I uh, really, really appreciate it. And uh, there's a lot of people out here that if they didn't know you, they know you now and uh, uh, continue to look up to you and, and try to serve our purpose in growing this profession right behind you. So I um, appreciate you being on, Glenn. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations to you too for doing this. I think it's a it's a great thing. I've been on a few of them and and watching. I think this has been great. So I'm glad you're doing this. Uh, I think this goes a long way to just advance the familiarization of the profession amongst all of us. And uh, I hate to say this because we've heard it so many times now in the last four months, but we're all in this together. Yep, you got it. You, you exactly. You got it. Uh, everybody else, really appreciate you guys being here as well. And for those of you picking it up on YouTube, uh, make sure that uh, you stay on here. Let's chat an athletic therapy roundtable. Our next session will go Sunday night, uh, 7:45 Eastern, with Joe Hurtabies, a PhD in neuroscience, uh, CATA, uh, now out west. Um, has and she is awesome. West, and she is fantastic. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Glenn, not uh, out to you, man. Uh, really, really appreciate everything that you said, taking it to heart and, and using it in the future and, uh, and in the current times as well. So uh, thank you again. This has been amazing. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk again soon. Okay. Take care. Thanks a lot. All right. Good night. See you, Alex. <laughs>